So, what are matrices good for? This video introduces the first of many uses of matrices, and introduces a key algorithm. Matrices can be used to solve systems of linear equations. For the third or fourth time, what is a linear equation? It is an equation in some variables x1 to xn, where the variables are multiplied by constants a1 to an added together and made equal to some other constant c. A system of linear equations is a finite number of these equations, all of which use the same variables. Now, how do I solve a system of linear equations? There are a number of approaches. I can try and isolate some variables and replace them in other equations. I can use other algebraic manipulations to try and pull out certain variables. I can add or subtract one equation from another to try to get rid of variables and boil down the system. All of these methods are valid, but it might be nice to have one consistent algorithmic method. In addition, keeping track of the information can easily become unwieldy, particularly for complicated systems with many variables and many equations. So let me consider three basic operations. I can scale an equation, that is multiply both sides of the equation by some constant. I can add one equation to another, and this is almost trivial, I can change the order in which the equations are displayed. It turns out that only using these three operations, I can always solve any linear system. And I'm going to use these operations and only these operations to build an algorithm. The key to this algorithm to solve linear systems is keeping track of all the data, the constants, the equations, the variables as I go along. This is where matrices help. Unsurprisingly, an array of data is a useful way to store the data and manipulate it. If I have a system, here is the process for transferring the system into a matrix. Each equation of the system becomes a row of the matrix. I take the constants, but not the variables of the system, row by row, and I transfer them into the matrix. I put a division in the matrix where the equal sign was in the system, with all the variables to the left and the other constants to the right. And I end up with an extended matrix, which has one row for each equation and one column for each variable, plus a column for the additional constant. The variables themselves are not in the matrix. I keep track of the variables just by the columns. The first column is for the first variable, the second column for the second, and so on. Let me show you an example. Here is a system of three equations and three variables, x, y, and z. I write the equations with all the variables on the left and the other constant on the right. Then I transfer the numbers row by row. The first row has the constants negative 1, 3, 6, and 1 after the equal sign. Well, I write them in the matrix. The second equation has the constants 2, 2, 2, and negative 6. So I write them in the matrix. And the third row has constants 5, negative 5, 1, and 0. And again, I write them in the matrix. In this way, I produce a 3 by 4 extended matrix that captures all of the information about the system. Here is another example. Again, three equations and three variables. And again, I write the equations in the correct setup, variables on the left and the other constants on the right. Then, row by row, I transfer the coefficients into the matrix. Finally, one more example. Again, with three equations and three variables. This one is slightly tricky. In the first equation, y doesn't show up. Well, that's the same, though, as y multiplied by 0. If a variable is missing, then the constant for that variable must be 0. So I transfer 1, 0, negative 2, and 0 for the first row. The second row is missing x, so when I transfer the constants, I write 0 in the x spot. And the third row is missing z, so when I transfer the constants, I write 0 in the z spot. So now I have a data structure to keep track of linear equations. I said I would build an algorithm out of three operations, multiplying equations by constants, adding one equation to another, and changing the order. All three of these operations can be expressed as operations on the matrix. Since the equations became rows, these operations are called row operations. Instead of multiplying an equation by a constant, 
I multiply a row by a constant. Instead of changing the order of the equations, I change the order of the rows. And instead of adding one equation to another equation, I add one row to another. Often I combine the first and third of these into one operation, adding a multiple of a row from another. These are now things I can do to the matrix to try and solve the system. Before I get into the weeds of the algorithm, what is the goal? Well, certain matrices describe solutions to systems. I want to change the matrix, the data structure for the system of equations, until I can just read off the solution. What does that look like? Well, ideally, it looks like this. Here's a matrix. If I translate this back into equations, the first row becomes x plus 0y plus 0z equals negative 3, which is just x equals negative 3. And similarly, the second equation becomes y equals negative 2, and the third equation z equals 8. This is a solution. It specifies the values of the variables. Therefore, to solve a system, I have to manipulate the matrix until it looks like this. This form of a matrix, where I can read off the solutions to the linear system, is called the reduced row echelon form. Here are the rules for this form. The first non-zero entry in each row must be a 1, and these ones are called leading ones. Since the first non-zero entry must be a 1, ending up with a row of zeros is in fact perfectly fine in this form. Each leading one is in a column where all the other entries must be zero. So, above and below a leading one, I can only find zeros in the matrix. Finally, there are no other rules about columns that don't have a leading one. These columns can contain any numbers, as long as they don't contradict the first rule that, in any row, there are only zeros before the leading one. A matrix that is in this form will produce a readable solution. So, now I have a data structure, the matrix, and a goal, the reduced row echelon form of the matrix. To solve a system, I encode it as a matrix and use row operations to turn it into a reduced row echelon form. This is always possible. How is it done? These are the steps of the algorithm. I make a leading one in one of the rows. Then I clear the column above and below that leading one by adding ro rows to other rows. Having made a leading one with a clear column above and below it, I move on to another row and repeat the process, and I stop when all rows have leading ones or are rows of zeros. In the next video, I'll do examples. So even though I hope you get the general idea, the examples will make the algorithm much clearer. And finally, before I finish this video, one last definition. Leading ones are important pieces in the reduced row echelon form. They will turn into the variables in the interpretation. I would like to keep track of the number of these leading ones. Such a number is called the rank of a matrix. So for any matrix, the rank is the number of leading ones in its reduced row echelon form.